I also want to thank all of our participants uh, from the Roundtable on Race this summer. I know all of you remember that we had video segments coming out throughout the summer of um, our different members of our community uh, that offered their perspectives on race and their experiences around race. Today, we have those participants online with us, and they include Adam Crew, Cheryl Sims, Jacqueline Hand, who I hope will join us. She's not with us quite yet. Gloria Moy, Alex D'Souza, and Dwayne Land. And as most of you will remember, a couple of weeks ago, we invited questions from our community of faith. And so we took those questions and then we asked our panelists if they had questions they wanted to add. We came up with a list of six questions that we would like to share with our panelists today and just have a kind of a discussion within the group about where we are, what people are feeling and thinking about the current environment and where we go from here. So let's start if we can. Um, we're gonna run for about 30 minutes. And then at the end, we're gonna have about a 10 minute coffee hour. Um, I think Joe Pila is gonna host that for us. We'll all be on it, but um, have an opportunity to visit a more in a more informal setting. So if we can go to gallery setting, that would be great, Rodney. Uh, you should be able to view everyone now. Okay, great. Um, let me start with the first question and throw it out to our group. Do people see the church as being key to turning the tide on racial injustice in America? Who would like to start us off? Gloria. Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, I, I believe that the people see the church or the whatever house of worship as being key in um, turning the tide in racial injustice in America. There's a lot of folks that go to church, whether they're Christians or not, that believe whatever comes off the pulpit is gospel, that whatever the minister says, whatever the church says, is what you run with. And I kind of ran into that um, back in... 2014-15 with um, after Michael Ferguson was murdered in, in um, Missouri um, where everything and please don't get me wrong I, I, I understand it now I didn't understand it then where everything off the pulpit was about Black Lives Black Lives Matters but I being an Asian American sit there going well wait wait you know there were a bunch of us that weren't African American that were in the congregation going so we, we get it but what about us so I think what's important is that for ministers, for people, leadership in houses of worship, that you need to be careful about what you say off the pulpit. And you need to make sure that people are not taking what you say and running with it, whether it's a gospel of hate, which comes down from a lot of, I don't want to say hate, but, but, but um, ignorance of what's passed down for generations. And people just run out and go, I went to church and they said this, so I'm going to do that. You know, we have to be careful at what we say as leaders, that um, even though it's in our heart, we need to be careful how we put it out there. That you just have to, just just have to try to be, you know, whatever you can, you say off the, off the, as a leader does not omit people, does not make people feel like they've been othered. But in fact, they're trying to talk about injustice and in, in race in this country. I'm going to invite our panelists to jump in anytime. If anybody else would like to address this question, um, please do. So it can be an internal dialogue as you feel uh, so led within our group. I may add. Um, I I also feel it's it's um, kind of the same thing in a sense. At least for me, like I know, like I know our church is extremely inclusive you know, people come from all kinds of communities in our church. And I think when, you know, somebody walks in and sees that as an example, you know, that we can work together and that we, you know, that all kinds of people are coming together and that, you know, with the, um, with things, uh, you know, everything from Michael Ferguson to, um, to, oh my god how am i playing there's unfortunately so many names but like brianna taylor and and 
Well, that, you know, we are looking at all the injustices. We've also talked about, you know, what's happened when every time Trump says things like, you know, calling it the Chinese flu and the, the issues that have happened with racism against Asian Americans um, because of coronavirus. And, um, and then the issues with Muslims when everybody was like, they're all attacking us. And it's like, no. Um, so I think that is a way that at least, you know, definitely in our church and churches more like ours, where things have been very inclusive, I think it is a nice, it is a safe space that people can come to and see that, you know, we can care all about each other. And this is part of um, what a church is supposed to be um, and can do um, as a service in, uh, in all kinds of relations, you know, racial and cultural relations, if that made any sense at all. <laughs> so. I actually wanted to chime in here also um, that um, I hear you, Gloria. You know, it's not just about Blacks, you know, Black lives. Um, it's about all these minorities of different ethnic backgrounds or whatever that have been discriminated against, even Native Americans. You know, like nobody really talks about the plight of what's happened with them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like it's, but I can say being a person of color, a black person in America, who's, um, you know, my ancestors were slaves or whatever, that um, the, um, the discrimination against one group leads to the discrimination against other groups. And that's the whole mm -hmm. thing. If we would have solved in this country the discrimination against Blacks from the beginning in the 1600s or whatever, when Blacks were being brought over here as slaves, we wouldn't be talking about discrimination against other groups then. You know, and my, my take on what role the church has in that is that, and from the infancy of the inception of this country, when it was being started, the church played a role in, um, in, in helping to institutionalize racism in this country because there was silence from the church community when atrocities were being done to black bodies. When um, that we're, not, we're doing in Bible studies about the lynching of blacks, right? But it's more than that, you know, the, just from slavery alone and the beatings that they took and the rapes that were taking place there, all the other things that were happening the church was silent, or there were some people who were actually a part of the church that were actually participating in some of these things too. And mm -hmm. it gave the, um, it gave our society that was just starting out here in this new, in this land, I won't say a new land because it belonged to somebody else, um, that it gave them that chance to um, feel that their actions were being condoned, that it was okay for them to do this and it became a cultural institution that we have been trying to fight and change for so long. And just like I believe that um, the church didn't say, hey, stop this, this is not okay, this is immoral. I think that if the church now, and when I say the church, I'm talking about the <laughs> white, uh, uh, what do you call it? The white Christian church of power, of political power. Mm -hmm. and, and if you don't think it still exists in this country, take a look at the U.S. Supreme Court right now, okay? It still is, there's a faction of the church that still reigns in the political arena of this country, and they dictate policy, and that they, um, they don't speak about the, the injustices that, that happen in this country against minorities. And I think that if they would change and they would shift and they would stand up, then I think that a lot of what we're seeking to remedy would actually take place in this country. Mm. Yeah. Right. Well, Cheryl, you've led us into um, another question that I wanna throw out. Um, do the events of this year change your view of how race is regarded in our society? Maybe I'll throw a tagline on that. Does it does it affect your view of how race is regarded in our society, and does it affect your sense of hope? Mm -hmm. 
if I may chime in on that, um, I just, it's one of those things where I think, you know, you're, you're sort of caught in the conundrum of, well, that's normal. You know, like, I think there are a lot of people who have looked at this and said, this is the way it's been. Like people of color are still going to look at all of what's been going on. They're like, yeah, now the rest of you are seeing it. Um, and you know, now it's getting more attention or it's actually getting attention where it might not have before. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, part of it is that, you know, we're, you know, we've been stuck at home a lot <laughs> and there's more time to sit and actually have these conversations and see all this stuff that's coming out. And people are having more time to think about um, what's been going on. And you know, and, and but even before that, you know, with the 1619 project and, you know, with these uh, situations, with Black Lives Matter rising and coming out there and making sure, you know, that, you know, this history is getting spoken about and, you know, is more out in the forefront. Because um, I think of, you know, when I was going to school and I, and I, I feel like I, went, I, you know, lived in a somewhat progressive town, I, there was so much stuff that I was not learning. I think we all can say that, you know, that particularly if you were growing up in the 70s and 80s, or even the 90s, there's a lot that was not in your textbooks, mm -hmm. you know, and now, now there are things like the 1619 Project and other such programs that are being put out there. Right now, my son's class, they're doing a whole thing about, um, they're doing a whole social justice segment and the kids are being asked, you know, they're learning about, there are wonderful books out now that talk, that are basically allowing children to talk about racism, about um, misogyny, gender bias, um, and things like that. So this is something that's luckily starting to grow now. Um, so in that sense, I do see a glimmer of hope but at the same time with our election, there were still 70 odd million people that voted for Trump. It's like Biden got more by like 6 million votes, thank goodness. But there were still enough people out there that think Trump is still the person to run an office, to, to be president. And while a lot of them say they're voting strictly on the economy, to know that that, that matters more than how uh, people of color are treated, how indigenous people are treated, um, how the LGBT community is treated, how the immigrant community is treated. To think, to look at all the horrible things that have been going on for so long, and just go and think that you know, oh, he's just a loudmouth, but I've got more money in my paycheck now. I say that's more important. What does that say? You know, it's like, so it's, uh, it's just right now such a toss up for me. Um, anybody else want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, kind of piggybacking on what you're saying. I think, um, I think the, the great part about this year is like, at least it's on the table now. People are talking about it. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't, I don't think racial injustice has been, it's been around for our whole history, right? And it's been around for forever. Um, and it was kind of just actions that were done and people just kind of swept it under the cup, under the rug, you know, and, you know, lynchings and beatings and all sorts of things that you just have been going on for years and years, they wouldn't get widespread support. And I think what was encouraging this year is you had people from all different backgrounds in support of actually change. And I think in the past, it's been more one, one race, whether it's been, you know, for African-American rights, I think you generally don't see, you see generally see African Americans going to protest. You wouldn't see as many people from other races. Um, if you look at the protests that happened this year, I mean, you see everyone. Um, and what's even like younger people, which I think is the most encouraging because it may or be harder to change the older person's perspective, not giving them, not saying that they won't, but you know, when it's been ingrained in your for a long time, it's a lot harder, I think, to change. Um, but I think as you see the dynamic of younger people coming out, it gives a little bit of hope that maybe people are starting to see what's going on and wanting to change a little bit. And it's obviously not going to happen overnight, um, but just little steps that people are um, being mindful about it. 
Uh, we have corporations that are being a little more mindful about it. People are at least mm -hmm. talking about it. And, you know, I, I think that's the first step to trying to have any sort of change. As, as Alex said, I mean, there's still way too many, there's a huge division in this nation, right? Like 70 million people or, you know, we're 76 million. There's still a lot of people who believe one thing and don't believe the other, right? And I don't think that's necessarily gonna change. But um, at least having a conversation about it and then also having the space to discuss it as you're saying in the schools. And I think people, I can't say how many people have actually come up and talked to me and like, you know, once they've done some introspection, like, oh, how do you feel about it? Or like, I didn't realize these certain things were happening with African-Americans. Like people just didn't know. And I, I don't know if that's just yeah. something we took for granted. I take for granted because that's just normal life for African-American people. But um, people are actually thinking about it and they're like, wow, I didn't know this existed. So even people thinking about it, um, I think is, is a step in the right direction. I, I do think it's a slow process, but that, that that's a glimmer that at least makes me feel like things are changing a little bit. I think this election has totally confirmed to me that on the on the scale of st static st statistics, Asians don't count. We don't count. Um, I mentioned this when I did my did my um, recording. The uh, ABC had a slide about how COVID's affecting the different races, and it was African Americans, Hispanics, and women. And if I got to throw in something at the TV, I certainly would have, because there are so many of us. I think um, these last couple comments really lead us to um, another one of the questions that we wanted to make sure we got at, which is, you know, we've talked about different generations. We've talked about, um, I mean, Alex raised specifically um, about her son, um, and. So one of the questions is, um, how important is it to you that your children or maybe the children in your lives or um, just in general have complete understanding of what racial bias means and how will or can this be an ongoing conversation? Well, um, I think this you know, the, I think it definitely can be an ongoing conversation. It looks like it's there. It's something that um, people are trying to do right now, um, because, I, I, like I said, at my at least at my son's school, and I know this is happening at other schools. Um, I have a friend who's a teacher um, at a high school here in uh, here in the Bronx, and. She is teaching a civics class and she is also making sure these conversations are happening. Um, we all know they have to happen and they should have started a long time ago. Um, and, uh, but I, I, I do think they can continue as well. I think, um, cause I'm so glad that, you know, it, there sometimes like a couple of the parents when this, they started this whole social justice segment, um, a couple of their parents were like, they're only in third grade. It's a little heavy for third grade, don't you think? And then we're all like, well, it's happening right now. It's like, if, if, you know, if you have the news on, if you have the newspaper out, if you, you know, these conversations are just, they're already around them. The kids are picking up on all of this. Mm -hmm. And then that's from small children to college kids. I mean, it's just definitely happening. Um, so I think that's why I'm glad that his class and his school are, are you know, have this segment going on. And, you know, they can pick up, you know, they can pick a topic that deals with race, that can deal with gender, that can deal with bullying, that can deal with, um, I think at least one other two um, topics like this. And um, and I and I and I think it I think it's great and I I, I just really do hope um, that it's something that continues. I think it will be something that continues because it became such um, a thing, particularly over the last four years, that and, and that and you know with what's going on right now with the election, I think like this they uh, I think it's something that's just going to have to continue. Um, and I think people want to continue. Um, 
but also if I may mention to Gloria, I have some, I have a, they're wonderful. Um, I know these Broadway performers, they have a great group. They started um, starting particularly at the beginning of the coronavirus. Um, it's called, uh, I mean, basically the hashtag is racism is a virus. And it's an Asian group of actors, performers and activists that wanted to get the word out. And um, so I know they have a website. Um, and so that's, so I know that conversation thankfully is happening as well. Um, um, Jacqueline, I was wondering if you could also chime in on this question because I know that- I was going to go next. <laughs> yes, please. I was going to go next. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I thought about this question because I, I work with a lot of young people and there were a lot of young people in my community and, um, you know, I'm a lady of a, a lot of the young kids that um, I have had the pleasure to work with in, in my career that are in their 20s and 30s. Um, it's wonderful to hear their perspective on what's happening in the country right now, especially a reference to race. And, you know, I, you know, after George Floyd, you know, I said to myself, I want to and come up with something that can be a contribution to what's happening in the world right now. And I said, I, I was going to focus myself on developing an African American Latin studies group to try to understand the bridge of what's happening and to deal with the emotions of what's going on right now. Um, there are a lot of young people in this country, a lot of young African American people in this country that are enraged and don't have an outlet of how to utilize that rage. So my perspective on it is to come in, hopefully, you know, as a bridge to say, let's figure out how we're going to work with all of this emotion, all of this high emotion. And let's come up with a plan where we can now start to talk about moving forward, what are we gonna, what are we gonna do in reference to education? And how are we gonna present it where people's feelings are validated? Because we need we need to be honest about, you know, validating people's feelings. And then we need to talk about not staying stuck in anger and not staying stuck in a place we want to uh, move forward. Um, I just want to share this quick story. Um, there was a young lady that I was talking to and we were doing like a Zoom kind of thing. And um, she said, you know, she said, Ms. Han, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I don't understand. She was like, wasn't that what the civil rights movement was for? She was like, wasn't that what people fought for years ago? And I said, my love, I said, I hate to be the bearer of bad news. I said, you don't get to sit out because somebody stood up for you. You don't get to sit out because somebody ran the first lap for you. I said, you know, when you, when you race and track, each person passes the baton to the next person. Mm -hmm. I said, so now someone is passing the baton to your generation. I said, so you can't think that you get to sit out for that reason. I said, now what we need to do is moving forward is we need to figure out with your generation, from my generation and the generation before, how are we gonna keep passing the baton? What changes will we make? How will we deal with this emotionally? How will we address this in a way that is constructive and positive? And how will we continue to keep educating people about the past, the present, and what can happen in the future? I said, that's what we are. And I, I wanted to validate her feelings. I really wanted to validate her anger and her disappointment. But I wanted her to understand also that this is an op this this year gave everyone an opportunity to sit down, to sit out, to think, to get in touch, to come up with a plan, and to try to make this try to gather an understanding in your own psyche of how you would like to see the world moving forward. Yeah. Then that leads straight, like perfectly transitioned right to um, another question of, I know I'm, we're getting close to time, but um, we've talked about our, 
the kind of past, um, you all have shared your stories um, and, and we've looked back a little bit in our conversation here. We've also just kind of been talking about the future of what we hope um, for our children and the next generations. And then and Jackie, you also brought up, um, we also need to be addressing the present. And so um, Joanne, I wonder if you could um, address this of, um, you know, how, how do you feel about the current environment, um, about the present right now? Um, and then what are your hopes um, for for the present? Um, right now, I'm never used to see this um, during my lifetime. Um, since the 60s, it's, um, I haven't seen uh, this since the 60s. Um, I hope it go far, everything go forward uh, since the, um, since we got a new electorate on um, president, I hope it, um, one thing I'm worried about, one thing I'm worried about, uh, it never ends with um, Trump um, still trying to fight uh, fight for a re-election until, um, until the 20th, January 20th, that's what. My thoughts of um, he messing everything up and in the democracy in the future, in the future, future years. Just so open. Thank you. Um, Heather, I, w I wanted to just kind of like add, tack something on to the last conversation and, and then answer your current one. Um, I want to go back to address something, you know, um, Gloria's concern. And, and one of the things I want to validate, Gloria, what you were saying, because um, Asians, Americans get discriminated against not just by white people in this country, but also by other uh, minority groups. I know this for a fact because I teach school. Well, I used to teach school and I had to like address this a lot of times and stuff. Um, and, and it doesn't get, um, that, that, that type of discrimination goes on rampantly. People ignore it. Nobody really addresses it and stuff. Nobody talks about it. So I can feel your discomfort and your pain about how um, Asians are kind of like left out. And if you think about even with um, what happened with the um, Japanese internment in this country, and, the, and when we have these, um, Mexican Americans that were, or Mexicans trying to come into this country with the kids being detained and separated from their families. All of these things are really a part, part of the same poisonous tree. And so that my point, my feeling is that if we can address, if we start to address discrimination and really take it seriously and look at the moral um, uh, impact of, of really addressing these uh, discrimination of one group or several. I mean, like, I don't know how we can tackle this to really, this is a big problem, but we need to start somewhere. And if we can start to get people to say that things are morally in, um, not right when, when people are being abused, when people are being unjustly accused, when people are being um, beaten in the street or whatever is the reason what's happening, then um, people are being thrown in jail that hadn't committed a crime, things like that. That once we start to do that, it lends itself open to start looking at other avenues of where we, our society has been letting other people down. And I think, I think that that's part of getting to Heather's current question of where the hope is that by us actually having these discussions by us, as um, Alex was saying, in the schools, um, starting to um, broaden what the curriculum looks like, um, where these things are being addressed, that these things are hope, you know, that change is going to happen. And my hope really actually comes from the the um, young, younger generation that is entering college right now, because they are the ones who just went through like the people of the 1960s, you know, where there was these protests and, you know, um, and, and people had to get out and, and learn to use voting as a way of getting a voice that this generation that is entering college now 
just learned, just went through that experience of mm -hmm. the months of protests and learning to, they got out in droves. I mean, record, record uh, amounts of people got out there and a lot of them were young. And so they were learning from another generation. So my hope is that the fight doesn't end with us. You know, before I was worried about that, but now I see that there's another generation that can pick up this mantle and keep moving forward. And if, if I might just jump on that, um, and to see more white students learning about this and taking it in and going, what can I do now? Mm -hmm. And I have a I have a high school friend um, whose son uh, went to UNC and recently graduated, and um, and this is a young white student. And this was, uh, he made a, a, like a 10 minute documentary about um, the taking down of civil war monuments. And there was a monument that was taken down at UNC Chapel Hill. And, and he was, and it really made him think about, he's like, you know, here I am, I, you know, might not even take that much notice of it, but knowing that classmates of his would look at that and automatically know that's a symbol of oppression right there. Mm -hmm. And, and he's, and so he, you know, basically talked about his own experience with that, but, talk, but had um, classmates talk about their experience as well. So, you know, he's another young man and now he's a budding, budding filmmaker out in Los Angeles, but he is trying to um, tell these stories as well. So, you know, it's nice to see so many different kinds of young people getting out there and again, continuing these conversations and opening them up. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of bad things about social media personally, um, but I do think that you can't really hide anymore. Like things that are going on around the open. And so whether it's for better or for worse, I mean, yeah, both, both ways, but I think everything's out there and what people are doing is out there. and it's kind of hard to keep a perspective where you don't have any, not like any thoughts about it. You kind of, it's in front of you. Everything's in front of you. You get the news is right there. You see what people are doing. You have to have a perspective one way or the other. It's kind of hard just to sit on the fence. I think more now, I think. Um, and I think again, just having it out there keeps the conversation going and kind of to what Cheryl was saying too. I think, you know, the, the younger generation, they see that. And I, I think, it's important that everyone sees what's going on and you, you do take that perspective of what is going on and hopefully you take it in a way that's going to be productive and, and move forward but I, I do think the conversation continues and you know kind of piggyback on the last thing I mean I think there's no way that the idea of racial bias can't be talked about I think once it's kind of out in the open I think people are going to talk about it it's, it's out there so now it's just we have to continue to push for mm -hmm. and I think it's going to be small incremental changes I don't think it's a big Wide, widespread movement, but I, I think it's a big movement, but I still think it's gonna be small things that get us there. Mm -hmm. But I think over time and over time, things will get to a point, hopefully, where we see the, the improvement that it will help all races. Any last words um, from this incredibly powerful conversation? Well, I want to thank our participants so much um, for not only being willing to be with us today, but just being able to be comfortable with raw honesty and, and openness in this conversation. Please, I, I don't want us to underestimate the power of a conversation like this. It was said by many of you, um, this is where we have to start. We have to start with just having an honest, raw conversation about the realities of what surround us. And I'm so proud of this church for being able to host a holy space like this, a safe space where people can can speak. I just want to um, say how inspired I was by your words today. And I love this idea of the kind of continuum. Um, I think Jacqueline, you put it as, in terms of a relay race and the baton's been handed. And I think that's how I feel. And I, I think uh, probably Heather feels and many of us feel that the baton's now been handed and it's not just within our population um, of people of color or of different 
um, ethnicities or sexualities with our congregation, the baton's been handed to everyone. All of us now carry it. And it's conversations like this that lift us up and give us power to, to go forward with it. And so thank you so much for being with us today. We may continue this if people are interested and just keep the conversation going because 40 minutes doesn't seem like even half enough. But I know people have things to do today. So um, Rodney, if you want to unmute everyone, I know 